So let me uh, let me preface all of this by saying that I'm not a DNA analyst, but you know, in my role, I often consume the work product of DNA analysts. So I've I've read a large number of reports, and certainly from the investigative perspective, in, in sort of getting these samples and then reading the reports in my own cases. Certainly, I've seen two things. One, um, and they're all related, but you know, the the increased sensitivity of the testing, which is uh, a great thing has also increased the number of mixtures that we see in our samples. What we're finding in mixture interpretation is that the differences, the variations in testing platforms and training of analysts, that's causing people to make the determinations that are still subjective determinations in different ways. I, as an analyst, can make a decision on Wednesday that I would maybe make a different decision on a Friday at 5 o'clock. And I don't know how to fix that. But we are developing tools to assist these analysts to do things in a more consistent way. There are still some subjective inputs that complicate the system. But we are working on research to try to make standardized ways to do these things. And then I just think we need, you know, proficiency testing is important and oversight. It really is a fundamental uh, concern of ours is that people who graduate from our program who take positions in forensic laboratories have a way of, of understanding the evidence beyond what results it can provide. Uh, because very often they are being asked to provide some kind of information to a prosecutor, to an investigator. So we, we certainly wouldn't want them to inadvertently contribute to these sorts of mistakes. So we certainly show them first the sensitivity of the instrumentation. And students in our program in particular you know, develop their own DNA profiles. Um, also look for and develop DNA off of different items of evidence. And so they can directly assess their success rate or the, you know, the percentage of sample that they recover from evidentiary samples. So if nothing else, they'll certainly begin to appreciate the difficulty in finding the DNA and making sense of it. And also how easy it is to create uh, unintentional mixtures. If we have a well-trained group of scene investigators, I think there's a fair amount that we can do to limit the number of mixtures that we create in our sampling. Um, and so the example that comes to mind with something like this all the time is the idea, so let's say, you know, hypothetically, we have a car that has been stolen or we have somebody who's been carjacked. And what we want to do through the DNA is to put the perpetrator back in the car. And so if you weren't, you know, if you didn't understand the, the difficulty with mixture interpretation, you would think, well, I'll swab the steering wheel. And that steering wheel will, will, of course, give me both the vehicle owner and the perpetrator, right? The person who stole the car or used the car in the commission of a crime. But in reality, we're probably not going to get the person who touched the steering wheel last. Um, and if we did, they'd be lurking in the background of what would really look like a, a single source DNA profile that belongs to the vehicle owner. And so investigatively, if what I need to do is put somebody who's not normally in the car, in the car, I have to think about what surfaces inside that car would that person have touched that the vehicle owner would not have had a reason to touch recently. Part of that is having a deeper understanding of some of the concepts that we're using, where we've moved, we've sea changed in the last 10 years from frequentist statistics to Asian likelihood ratio statistics, and the implications that come along with that are very different. We've moved away from making decisions about inclusion and exclusion to observing a profile and determining if the profile supports one proposition over another, where we never rule out the alternative proposition. We're trying to back away from some of the, yes, it's him, to these things are consistent, but we acknowledge that we, it, rare events happen. So I think that's been the biggest thing for our field is that there is a big training and education gap around this change, this new implementation, and there aren't enough resources right now for us to address them. So if we have an item of evidence and part of what is being done at the laboratories is to swab it or sample it to get a profile to send to DNA, you know, the, the, you, could, you could appreciate the urge to sample a large enough area so that we have a sufficient quantity to get DNA. But when we think about items like guns in particular, 
the idea that we would swab the entire frame of the gun or that we would swab the entire uh, trigger assembly, you know, might create a mixture where what we want to do is think about the gun as having several different components, all of which might have different profiles on them. For instance, wouldn't you want to swab the muzzle end of the gun because whether you know it or not, perhaps the gun is pushed against the person who the gun is used against, right? So we might get the victim's profile off the muzzle and we might get the perpetrator's DNA off the slide or the frame as the person pulls the action back to, you know, uh, load the firearm. Uh, might that be different from or might there be a different mixture on the trigger guard or the trigger itself because the person who used the gun during the commission of that crime is not the only person who's fired that gun. And so now we have a mixture of DNA in another place. And then lastly, that magazine to include the bullets that are in the magazine separately. So, you know, we've had a lot of uh, investigative uh, fortune in getting CODIS hits off of bullets loaded into magazines. If you have a CODIS hit off of a bullet, and that means that the person is a convicted felon and they're no longer allowed to possess firearms or ammunition, that gives you a very um, worthwhile topic of the, for discussion during an interview as to why their DNA is now on an item that they should not be possessing as a convicted felon. And so instead of looking at a gun as a single item where you take one swab to try to get as much DNA as possible, I would urge people to, whenever possible, get smaller, more focused samples so that you can develop more a sense of the story that that gun has to tell. Um, to include, obviously, any potential biological fluids that might be along the side of the gun. We're recognizing that there are really serious differences from the ways that labs are doing things, and you're not going to get the same answer at every single laboratory across the country. And that's a scary and sad realization. But forensic science as a culture is sort of resistant to that kind of crit criticism. They will circle the wagons, and you will not be popular when you voice these criticisms. And I've seen attacks on John Butler and the people from NIST who wrote the Foundation Review. And these are people who are traditionally respected. I mean, he's written the textbooks that we all learn from. But if you criticize the field, if you come critical, then it's, it's a very caustic environment to work in, and not a lot of people want to do it. But it's so necessary. The scrutiny is so necessary. And calling out laboratories that need the, the extra education or clarification is the only way we're going to ever move forward as a field and standardize our work. Quite obviously, while DNA degrades, that's not the only reason for seeing incomplete uh, genetic information in, in, in an item of evidence. And so I think we need to develop, to develop ways of, of giving others the ability to figure those things out. Because if you just say that person cannot be excluded, a non-scientific juror is going to take that to mean they are included. But we don't say that specifically. We say something a bit more obtuse than that. So I think we need to do more to sort of make what we, pro what pre what we produce in terms of scientific reporting more accessible to a non-scientist. We know about direct contact, but then we know DNA can transfer secondarily and tertiarily. So we, we differentiate between direct contact and um, indirect contact. And we don't always know how DNA came, we never know how DNA came to be on an item. And so a lot of times in forensics, the question moves beyond, well, whose DNA could be here to how did this DNA get here? And one point I would like to make is that there are people that are researching in the field trying to address a framework and, and train analysts for how to address those how questions. But we're not doing that here in the States right now. And there are many experts that are opining about the likelihood of direct contact versus a transfer event, some transfer event. And that's really inappropriate. It's really speculative and it's not true scientific analysis. No matter how many papers you've read, you shouldn't be talking about how it got there. That's a transposition. And it's extremely dangerous to do it. I don't, it, the problem with experts and expertise is you feel like you've read all these things and you're drawing information from them. You should be able to use that information. 
But the current status of the literature shows us that we can't draw those inferences in any meaningful way, the ways that it's being done here in the United States. So what I would say is that the, the status, there's a lot of research ongoing on transfer, persistence, prevalence, and recovery, and it's informing a lot of different areas of the field. And there are a lot of really smart people working toward a way to address the how questions. But we don't have those in place here yet in the States, and we really need to avoid, as scientists, answering those questions because that's going to be one place where justice is going to miscarry. Someone is going to have an incomplete understanding or they haven't read this paper or some other paper and they're going to say something that sends someone who's innocent to jail for the rest of their life. The case was very difficult. I was involved in the case pre-trial, so this wasn't a post-conviction case of mine, um, but I initially had immediate concerns because I was aware through laboratory results that this person was a serial burglar. There were multiple cases that hit in the database where he was a petty burglar. Um, and then all of a sudden it hit to this horrific murder. And the murder, I mean, first of all, this person maintained his innocence. Um, he had a lot of strong support from the community. They can hook me up to a polygraph test at any given time, ask me any question they wish, and my answer will remain the same. I did not kill Mr. Sue. That's not a crime that he would have committed. And I stand on that. I put my life on that. I know he didn't. There were reporters that were contacting me, asking me to look at the evidence and see if, you know, this was the kind of thing that maybe I had identified when I had examined some of the things at Broward and we found some problems, but it really wasn't that. Um, and so I had been aware of the case before the attorneys had brought me on to work on it. But just the sheer number of cases made me concerned that there could be a contamination event. If he was an active burglar and crime scene personnel were responding to burglaries in other jurisdictions or other, you know, previous burglaries, it's possible on crime scene kits and gloves and things. And even the exterior of the home where the homicide occurred, you know, if he had been casing that home um, and active in that neighborhood, then there would be a chance that they could transfer small amounts of his DNA to items on the inside of the home from crime scene processing if they weren't really careful. And so I know that DNA transfer is even in the DNA lab when all those more heavily trained people at the FBI, the people with the best training in the world, still see contamination even when we're trying our hardest to prevent it. So when I talk, when I think about investigators at the crime scenes that don't have that level of training and understanding about transfer of DNA, it makes me very uncomfortable relying on that one piece of evidence from a database hit to, to build a whole case. And that's what happened in Deontay's case. There was a lot of other information that indicated that it was somebody close to Jill Sue who committed the crime. Um, their, you know, her, her killing was very brutal, um, and such that it made people think that there was some overkill and emotional involvement. And they looked very closely at the family. Initially, investigators did. I'm, that's a standard procedure. But once the DNA profile was discovered and that hit, um, the, the focus of the investigation completely changed in a way that I think was really concerning to me, knowing what I know about DNA. Police say Rosillas was at Sue's home trying to burglarize it when he found her inside. Sue's son, Justin, later found her face down in a bathtub with her hands and ankles bound. Prosecutors for the case told the jury the evidence pointed to Rosillas. For legal reasons, the lawyers decided to try and exclude any mention of the fact that he was a burglar because they thought that the jury would use that information and consider that he might have entered the house and, and she could have an occupied home and had to kill the occupant, even though that's not what the crime scene suggested. So they made a calculated legal decision to exclude any information about his prior activity as a burglar, which I think is a fundamental thing for them to understand. You have to tell people how that DNA could have gotten there. You have to give them some plausible reason to wrap their mind around. And the lawyers really couldn't do that in any meaningful way, um, except to just 
introduce these concepts generally without anything concrete. And that's always bothered me about um, truly innocent defendants. They're never going to know. They're never going to be able to offer you an explanation for how their DNA got on those items because they really don't know. So in this case, that has been a primary concern for me. It was an entire case built on the presence of DNA from this person. And there was very little consideration to what other reasons that there could be that that could have happened. The court now finds you guilty, adjudicates you guilty, and sentences you to life in prison. Deontay Rosillas learning his fate to judge sentencing him to life in prison for the 2014 murder of 59-year-old Jill Sue inside her Davy home. This sentencing comes after jurors found Rosillas guilty of first-degree murder in a retrial in March.